our next speaker, um, Andrew Rose from Tata Steel. Um, he's going to talk about uh, Super Bay Night. Yes, Super Bay Night. Uh, thank you. I'd like to begin by thanking Harry and the organising committee for, um, for uh, accepting my proposal for a paper here and allowing me to present this paper, which is on Tata Steel's work to move Super Bay Night from a laboratory concept to a commercial product. And there will, there, are, there will therefore be some obvious comparisons between what I'm going to say and the presentation by, given by Dr. Garthia Matteo uh, yesterday on the Superbane pro, on the Nanobane project. Um, I'm going to begin with wait. Um, a quick note on some definitions because I'm going to be using the word superbainite in two distinct senses. First of all, the one that many of us are familiar with. Superbainite is a steel structure which can be developed under certain circumstances having very high strength and hardness. And secondly, um, it's, also, it's also the term we used to refer to the Tata grade of strip steel which has been developed over the last few years which is able to be treated to give this structure. However, we sometimes refer to it as super bainite even when it doesn't have that structure. And as we all know, it was originally developed at Cambridge University in the 1990s in uh, Harry's group. So to begin with uh, the basics of super bainite metallurgy, uh, this is a, a, a CCT diagram, uh, which is the type of diagram metallurgists use to, to uh, describe the effect of cooling rates on the transformation behavior of different types of steel. And for, and for the super bainite treatment, what we need is a, a treatment profile like this, where the steel is cooled quickly from austenite temperature to a low temperature, and then given a long isothermal transformation treatment, during which the super bainite structure is formed. And super bainite has a high silicon level um, which gives the thermodynamic effect of suppressing carbide suppression in the superbainite structure. Two other things that we can, we can note from this uh, diagram before we move on are that there is a hardenability requirement. If you want to produce the superbainite structure in, in, in a thick section, uh, there has to be sufficient hardenability to get the whole of the set that nose knows uh, before, um, before perlite begins to form. And the, the last thing that can be noted from this diagram is that you also have the option of applying a slow cooling rate to the steel, and so you can still end up with a fully pearlitic structure, which will be relatively soft and formable. Uh, subsequently, that, can then be, that, that structure can then be treated to produce the superbainite structure. So what does the superbainite structure look like? Well, schematically, it looks like this, uh, very fine uh, carbide-free ferrite laths with pockets and films of retained austenite in, uh, in between them, which have an increased uh, carbon level, the carbon having been rejected from the, uh, from the ferrite laths that are formed, um, but uh, not formed carbides because of the effect of silicon. And the well-known electron micrograph showing this structure uh, shows these uh, features um, uh, in the structure, uh, ferrite laths with retained austenite in between them. So superbainite is a type of steel which has a very high carbon content plus other alloying elements present and a very fine structure which leads us to expect that it will have a very high strength and hardness and the claims made for the superbainite structure is that it can give about 2.2 gigapascals or more UTS and in a 3D structure. That is, it's uh, capable of being formed in a piece of steel which is both wide and thick. So it's a, three, a three, 3D structure. Well, it's all very well having a new wonder material, but you've got to have a use for it and you've got to be able to make it. The properties claimed for Super Bay Nights uh, led to the proposal that, act, that it could be used as as an armor steel. And this, this also coincided at the same time with a desire by Tata's Port, Port Talbot Works to move into higher value steels, 
which would certainly include armor steels, and also by a desire by the UK Ministry of Defense to develop an onshore supplier for armor steels. Uh, Tata steel, um, super bainite is there, was therefore considered to be suitable for armor plate, and if anybody needs a quote to prove it, that's a quote from Lord Drayson on the MOD's need for an onshore manufacturing capability for armor steels. The type of application that was, was envisaged for super bainite was as, the, as a plique armor, which uh, David described earlier this morning. That is, additional sheets of ar armor bolted onto the outside of a vehicle, giving additional protection to the, to, the, to the vehicle, and which can be replaced quickly in the event of battle damage. So the adventure for Tata Steel was to find out whether a super bainitic uh, steel could be made in a relatively thin uh, sheet form through a boss steel making route, boss steel making and hot strip rolling route to give, to, to give sheets of armor of sufficient flatness to be, to be used in this sort of way. The development activities undertaken in, in Tata steel uh, can be described like this. Um, at an early stage, there was a, there was a pilot scale plant made in the Normanton Heavy Pilot Plant at, at our Teesside Technology Centre. Uh, that's, a, that's a cast that was of about six tons size, which was cast as, as an ingot. And at that size, it's large enough for processing through commercial, mill, th through commercial mills. You can't put very small experimental steels through a commercial mill. They drop between the gaps of roller tables and get lost in other ways. Um, so you have to have a, have have a full-size cast to be able to do that. This cast enabled that to be done, and it demonstrated that commercial scale production was feasible. The ingot could be rolled to narrow slab and then to narrow strip, and this gave, gave confidence that such a steel could be processed through a commercial mill, and, and that it, it, it would have the properties required of an armor steel. There was also a considerable amount of work done at Tata Swindon Technology Centre, where, um, where I work, investigating the effects of possible variations in the, in the composition of the super bainite. Uh, I'll come to the reasons for those shortly, um, but that, that, that looked at, the, the, at those possible variations to and, and validated that, that the super bainite structure and properties could still be obtained under those conditions variations in compositions and also characterizing the properties to make sure that those could still be achieved. And finally, there was a considerable amount of modeling work done within uh, Tata R&D on the, uh, on the different steps of the uh, process route which we were expecting to follow uh, to validate that, that the steel could indeed be successfully processed through that route. So what was the process route? The route we were envisaging was an oxygen steel making route. Um, this is where uh, ASCO would have had a considerable adv advantage over Port Talbot in, the amount of, in, in their ability to put a large amount of alloying element in. In boss steel making, the alloying additions are only made after steel making, and the additions of, a large, of a large, amount, large amounts of alloying element um, have a big effect on temperature control in the steel. Next, it would be cast uh, as wide slab, and this uh, brings in considerations of the risks of breakout, segregation, and cracking. Uh, these relate both to the amount of alloying element present in, present in the steel and to the condition of the caster. Um, breakout, obviously undesirable, um, but segregation, uh, segregation would damage the, mater the material metallurgically and cracking on a large scale would also make it, make it unusable. So we had to be confident that we could continuously cast it in this form um, without, without incurring these problems. Next, hot strip rolling. Uh, when you put a strong steel through a, ro through, through a rolling mill, uh, even though it's hot, the, the mill still has to be strong enough to handle it, uh, but both, to, both to roll it and to coil it. And so we needed to be confident that this too could be done. 
That would lead to production as wide coiling. And then for downstream processing to armor plates, we would have to decoil the material and cut it to length, um, giving further problems of dealing with strong materials. Uh, laser profiling, uh, uh, cutting, the, cutting the steel into, into smaller pieces uh, for, further, for further processing as armor was expected to be done by, by, by laser cutting. Perforation and heat treatment, which are the final steps in, in forming the armor product, which I will talk about at the end of the lecture. And of course, um, we had to consider the overall cost and feasibility of this route. A point to note about the, the hot strip rolling route. Um, in, in hot strip rolling, the steel is rolled through, through a sequential rolling mill like this, uh, cooled on the run out table and then coiled. And, this, and the coiling step therefore gives a very slow cooling step at the end and so, and so we naturally have within the hot strip route the, abil the ability to cool the steel cl slow, slowly, slowly from the austenite temperature and give the steel in a, in a perlitic structure uh, which would be relatively amenable to further forming before heat treatment to form the superbainite structure. The modeling of the, of the hot strip rolling route can um, was done in Tata's Imauda Technology Center. Uh, they have a rolling model called Titan, and this could be used to predict the temperature profile that would be followed by different parts of the slab uh, moving through the rolling mill. Um, it's not a very surprising profile, I suppose, um, but you can see um, the points where the steel loses uh, temperature when it's actually within the strands. And the roll forces uh, required can also be predicted by this model. Um, uh, the model has to be calibrated by using hot workability data gained from Glebel testing. Uh, and that then when applied in the model, they validated that the, hot, the Port Talbot hot strip mill would be capable of rolling uh, superbainite to, 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 to the required gauges. So the commercial compositions that were eventually made were made to this specification and this is the published commercial spec of uh, Tata Superbainite steel and some points we can pick out from that. Um, silicon we know is necessary in, in Superbainite for, um, for suppression of the formation of carbides but this is a lower level uh, than was recommended by, by the original work. Um, because of the downward pressure that we were under to keep the uh, steel composition as, as lean as possible. I'll draw attention to the phosphorus level, although that's definitely not an element that we want. Um, but phosphorus is, is, is well known as being an element which promotes segregation in steel. And so we need to keep it to a minimum. And the chromium and molybdenum levels are are necessary to give sufficient hardenability within the steel. Uh, originally, we were, uh, we were hoping that we might be able to dispense with the molyb molybdenum as well, but we were also hoping, we were also envisaging initially that, that, the, that the cooling of superbainite from the austenite temperature to the isothermal treatment temperature would be done by forced air cooling and uh, in, in the light of that, the hardenability provided by molybdenum was found to be necessary. But molybdenum also has an additional advantage in that it's known to reduce the deleterious effects of phosphorus within the steel, so it was a good thing for that reason. The commercial casts made at Port Talbot have been uh, examined at uh, Swindon Technology Centre. In the as-rolled formed, as we expect, we get a perlitic structure, and when heat treated, we get a superbainitic structure shown there optically. Um, also by um, scanning electron uh, microscopy, uh, we get uh, this type of structure with a very fine structure with a blocky phase in, bet uh, in between it. Uh, the blocky phase was initially thought to be retained austenite. However, you can see on this that there is a fine structure within it. And when, when this was examined by um, EBSD, 
uh, we found that those blocky phases were indeed not all retained austenite. Um, uh, there were, um, you can see this, this uh, block here is largely austenite with only some ferrite within it. And examination by EBSD showed that the ferrite was in, was in the form of very fine uh, packets within, that, within those areas. The potential for segregation during casting was, would also have been a concern for us. And when we looked at the, uh, the hot rolled coil, we found a banded structure like this, which initially caught us a lot of concern. Would those white bands be martensite? Uh, examination showed that they were not martensite. They are segregated regions uh, where the chromium is sufficiently high to, to affect the etching behavior, but they're not actually martensite. Examination by transmission electron microscope showed, as I expect most of you expected, that the, that the tartar superbainite was not free of carbides. The, super, the silicon level was not sufficiently high to, to prevent that. However, the very fine bainite laths, we believe, are free of uh, carbides, uh, but there are carbides in other parts of the structure. Testing of the mechanical properties of the steel uh, gave the strength levels that were expected. Um, even testing high strength steels is difficult. Um, this, along with many of our, our other tensile tests, uh, failed, pre failed prematurely because during tensile testing of a high strength steel, the steel is very sensitive to the surface preparation of the material. However, um, th these tests have shown that the claimed tensile strengths can be achieved within this uh, material. Toughness was tested by Sharpie testing and gave what for a plate steel is a very poor Sharpie level. Um, however, it can be noted that these Sharpie, le Sharpie toughness levels are comparable with high carbon uh, rail steels. Now, I said earlier on that um, we were expecting to be, um, to be further processing the material by laser cutting. And so the effect of that on the material was also of, in, of interest. And when we looked at, the, um, at, at a laser cut edge of the material, we found that, as you might expect, uh, there was a layer of martensite along the edge of the, um, of the hole that was produced and uh, hardness rising to a very, a very uh, high level. Um, which had some other practical uh, concerns for us because we were hoping, that the hoping and planning that the steel would be able to be formed to a limited extent to curved shapes. And if the steel had been cut by, by laser cutting, um, a martensitic edge would make cracking from the edge, edge very likely. And this is what actually happened. Uh, and so laser cut steel has to be has to be either dressed or heat treated to remove the martensitic layer uh, before it can be successfully bent. I also said earlier that, that we were uh, hoping to be able to carry out heat treatment using forced air cooling from the, from the austenite temperature to form the, to, to the isothermal treatment temperature. Well, we tried to do that on a large sheet of steel and ended up with a piece of steel this shape. Um, so we, so we haven't pursued that route any further. Um, heat treatment has been carried out using a salt bath treatment of smaller um, pieces of steel, um, which can be uh, tightly clamped into, in, in, into a basket in this sort of arrangement, um, and, and heat treated in a salt bath uh, treatment furnace. And I have to mention here the contribution of ADI treatments in Birmingham for their contribution to the to the heat treatment work that's been carried out on, on superbainite. The salt bath treatment um, process works like this. Uh, you have a furnace, which is that shape, an austenitization zone at one end, um, a purge zone between, and a treatment chamber with a salt bath within it. Um, the basket of steel that I've just shown is passed initially to the austenitization, then through the salt bath, uh, and then out uh, that way. 
The temperature of the salt bath treatment can be changed, and so you have the possibility of, um, of, of getting a range of different property, properties within the steel um, by using different treatment temperatures. Uh, use of higher temperatures leads, as you would expect, to forming a softer structure, um, but, but, uh, take, but, but that structure taking uh, less time to form. Uh, the, I think the, the, there was a question yesterday about the effect of uh, manganese on the, on, the, on the formation of the superbainite structure. Uh, our work has indeed shown that the manganese level can have a significant effect on the rate at which uh, the superbainite structure is formed in this process. So we come now to the, uh, to the armor steel product. Shown here, this is an actual piece of superbainite armor. And after all the exciting metallurgy that's gone on in, 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 in superbainite, the most exciting thing that everybody seems to be able to see about superbainite armor is that it's got holes in it. Um, Counterintuitively for armor, um, but the effect of perforation in armor is to increase the ballistic efficiency of the armor by deflecting bullets, reducing the weight of the armor, and acting as crack stoppers. Don't worry, I've nearly finished. Um, this slide shows two pieces of, of superbainite that have been ballistically tested. Monolithic piece without uh, perforation, and it's ended up in many pieces, perforated um, with several hits in it, and it's still in one piece. And so that brings me to my conclusions. Uh, superbainite developed as a laboratory co concept, investigated in laboratory and pilot scale testing, put into commercial production, and bainitic armor steels are still under development. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, question, anyone? Oh, uh, thank, thanks, Andrew. Ha have you thought or tried, uh, thought of or tried um, to do the, uh, the os tempering treatment in the you know, hot strip mill wound coil form somehow? Um, uh, no, because um, superbainite in the heat treated condition is not deformable at all. Um, and so if you form super, the superbainite structure on the coil, yeah. you'd never be able to uncoil it. <laughs> <laughs> Anymore? So you mentioned about cost and affordability of this product, so in the early part of that. So have you done the analysis that this is indeed competing with existing armors, or that's it? Uh, it's yes. It's possible to talk. Yeah, um, yeah, yes, yes, we believe, believe, that, believe that it would be competitive with, with existing armor. Uh, I can't quote figures. Um, not because I'm not allowed to, but because I can't. Um, 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 but, um, but, but yes, we do believe that it's competitive, yes. So the figures are public. You, you have seen them before. Yeah. Thank you, Andrew. Thank that you. was a very interesting talk, actually. Um, are you able to comment on whether you saw intergranular fracture? on your tensile tests? Uh, no. Um, I, I, um, I don't think we've actually done fractography on the, on, on, on the tensile specimens. Thank so, you. No. Um, I, I um, um, hello. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, regarding those blocky areas, and yeah. you were saying that they were According to EBST phase mapping, they were not necessarily all austenite. They were some yes. ferrite, some austenite. Yes. Well, last year I was doing some work with, with someone from Senim, and she had measured the um, gamma content using, was it X-ray? X-ray. X-ray. Yeah. And then we were doing the same with EBST. We found consistently there was a lot less austenite as measured using EBST <coughs> than there was as using X-ray. Yeah, that's that. So yes. I am... Not convinced that the EBSD is always no. correctly attributing e the phase. EBS EBSD always gives a lower 
uh, retained austenite fraction than XRD because, the, because XRD cannot resolve um, very small areas of, 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 retained, of, yeah. of, of, of retained austenite. So our, 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 extra, our XRD results were uh, for retained austenite are often in the 20% area where our EBSD results are in the sort of 5 to 10% area. Right, those, so are, you're, those, you're those, this those sort of figures, yes. Would it possible that the retained austenite transformed to mountain site during a sample pre preparation uh, for EBSD? Um, it is possible, I think. Yeah. Um, the, yes, the, some, uh, some of those microstructures um, look. Yeah. Um, um, look at bear, bear a lot of similarity to to yeah. to, to, to Martin site on on, 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 on under EBSD. Yeah. Um, but we um, we also believe that transformation to, for, of, of retained austenite um, takes place during ballistic testing. Yeah. Hardly surprisingly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, 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 sorry. Um, it's a pity that uh, you didn't show the evolution of the microstructure as the transformation temperature. You just saw an SEN micrograph with a micron-sized blocky austenite that I believe he should be responsible of the low ductility that you, you found uh, in comparison to the original alloys or nanovane uh, development. But um, I wonder if you got fully transformed your steel at uh, that transformation temperatures that you did. You didn't supply quite clear, you didn't provide quite clear kinetics analysis of that. Uh, what was the heat treatment temperature and time of those micrographs that you saw and those properties, tensile tests that you saw? Most, uh, most, most of our heat treatments have been done at 225 degrees. Uh, and we believe that um, transformation is largely complete within eight hours. Um, um, this, is, th this is another area where we're under a practical constraint in terms of the, of the heat treatment <coughs> time that can be carried out by a commercial heat, by, by a commercial heat treater. Um, but, uh, but we believe that, that heat treatment is, is largely complete within that time. Um. Okay, so how to prevent the harpon signification and gray continuing continuous casting? Sorry? I, I, how to prevent the harpon signification and cracking of a snapple during continuous casting? How to prevent the ca ca carbon, ca ca carbon, segrega carbon segregation? Yes. Carbon segregation and cracking. Um, it's a matter of making sure that the casting machine is in tip top alignment condition. Uh, before the casting is carried out. Um, uh, well, that's basically it, really. Um, um, yes, it, to, to control segregation it, it, during continuous casting, the, um, the, the machine has to, be, has, to be, has to be in very good condition. Uh, and, um, and also, the slabs have to be slow-cooled um, when they're taken off the end of the um, casting machine um, to, to, to reduce the risk of, of, uh, of thermal cracking, uh, which can, in extreme cases, can cause a, a slab to drop in two. Uh, so, yes. Uh, we have a question from the uh, internet. Uh, David Hoydick is asking, is the perforation uh, done by a thermal press? If it's a thermal process, if so, does the heat affected zone present a problem? Is the preparation done by a thermal process? Uh, which preparation? I'm sorry, I don't know. Perforation. Per -perf no, no. Um, perforation, we've, we have looked at laser, um, laser, laser cutting, um, uh, stamping, and uh, punching, and uh, drilling. Uh, the laser cutting um, is a thermal process, uh, and, and the, the, the micrograph I, I showed at the laser cut edge um, um, was, uh, was the edge of a perforation um, that, that was produced in that way, and so it causes the sort of problems that I talked about. Um, punching and, uh, and, and drilling are, are, are not thermal processes. Um, 
Thank you, Andrew. Okay. Thank you.